journey of magic and wonder, Johan Chapal presents the love edition of the Not So Trash Reasons. Hello, movie buffs and cinephiles, and welcome to another episode of the new podcast show, The Not-So-Trash Reviews. My name is Johan Schapol, your host, and a love of everything detailing movie magic and cinematic witchcraft. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you. For all those who listened to the previous episode, I got some wonderful praise for the new approach to the show, as well as some critical and constructive feedback on how to improve it for future episodes. It was heartwarming to know that so many of you are on board with this new format, and while it's still in its early stages and a bit of a balancing act, I want to make sure that you get the best out of each episode, and hopefully discover something new. I have taken everything into consideration and plan on making changes where needed. I want this show to feel like a collaboration where you, my fellow cinephiles, have a say. Speaking of which, before we get on with the show, a few of you guys contacted me via social media asking how you guys can help support the trash tapes as well as enigmatic productions as a whole. Well, both Edward Harvey and I now have officially opened some support pages via a website called Buy Me A Coffee. Buymeacoffee.com forward slash the trash tapes will help in supporting the podcast show, while buymeacoffee.com forward slash Harvey Retro will help with the enigmatic videos. We plan on posting things such as behind the scenes content, asking the community for reviews, and so much more on those places. You can either give us a one off donation of just five pounds, or if you want to keep supporting me and the show monthly, we now have a membership scheme ready to go with multi tiers of support all starting off at the price of a two-day VHS rental at your local Blockbuster. So go out there and rent a tape. The links for these websites can be found in the description below. And now, on with the show! Because we're just about reaching the end of February and the month of love, I was joined by fellow cinephile Eliza Russo as we scratch the surface of the 2016 feminist homage to 60s cinema, The Love Witch. After Jerry died, the cops wouldn't stop harassing me. They couldn't prove anything. They actually thought that I killed him. Anyways, San Francisco got to be a really bad trip after you left. And that's when I remembered you had that extra apartment. Hey, I'm Trish. Hi, Trish. Well, what do men want? Just a pretty woman to love and to take care of them. Love me. Love me. What is it? Well, I met this great-looking guy, and I used love magic on him. And then he got really weird on me. All these emotions started flowing out of him. And then he got really mm. sick. Witchcraft is just a way of concentrating energy. You can only work with what's already there. I just use sex magic to create love magic. <laughs> Sometimes it's almost scary how strong the love gets. And sex magic, of course. And I am joined here by Eliza. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm really good. Um, I'm really good, actually. And obviously, um, there's a time difference between us. There's a whole ocean and a bit between us. So for we're, I'm recording this at about now 12.30 in the morning. But to be frank with this movie we're about to talk about, it's good to kind of talk about this movie after dark, I think. <laughs> I agree. Definitely the After Dark kind of affair. So so there's a thing, actually. There's, there's a couple of reasons why I wanted to have you on. And one thing is, obviously, I've actually wanted you to on the... I actually kind of wanted to have you... have a reason to put you on the show for a while anyway. Because I kind of... 
No, because honestly, because I feel like obviously you, you you're, you're you're an incredibly bright person, and I feel like also talking about this kind of stuff, you can go deep dive into this. So I kind of need that as well. But I needed a special project, like I needed something that really stood out, and I couldn't think of anyone else, oddly enough, that would help cover the movie we're talking about today, which is The Love Witch, with w- w- from a perspective that would make sense for this movie. If that makes if if you completely understand. I do, definitely. Um, maybe like a woman perspective, maybe queer woman perspective, Bay mm. Area queer woman perspective. There's three different perspectives all in one here. Also and- also a bit witchy. I know you don't have a video podcast, but... But yeah, I know you don't, but you got, but you know, the witchy aesthetic. But yeah, um, so the movie we're talking about basically is The Love Witch, um, which I feel like what I love about the, what I love about it, it's it, this is this is the kind of movie that I remember when it first came out, that there was a big hype around it, at least at least around where I was. The trailers were everywhere and people going like, what is this? It's really, really interesting. Like it's like because it's so colorful and so, so colorful. This movie looks like a bowl of candy. Like you just mm. want to go in and grab at it. It's delicious and like it is sensorily appealing. Mm. It's because uh, it's one of the movies that it, it it's it's basically really trying to pull up those nineteen sixties Technicolor films. Absolutely, and didn't they also uh, film it um, on like thirty five millimeter to actually get that? Effect. Yes. Yes, they actually did. They filmed in 35 millimeter. And apparently this was one of the last films to be cut in the original camera negative. So it's not been, it wasn't manipulated or put into digital and adjusted from there. It was cut directly from the film itself. So that means no wonder it looks so popping. It looks perfect. Like it looks absolutely of what it is trying to echo. Yeah, which, uh, oh, and this is the thing is the director, obviously, Anna Billa, uh, she does a lot of, she, she's only done a few feature films, but all her feature films have this period aesthetic. I think she just generally likes the aesthetic of this of the 60s uh, Technicolor films. Uh, and she loves that look. And in this one, Anna Billa, she does everything. Do you know all her credits? She's done. <laughs> she was the writer, the director, the producer. She was, she was the musician for some of these things. Basically, all the folky songs she wrote, all the lyrics and the guitar and, and, and the harp music she wrote herself uh she also did she was also was the costume designer she was the set designer she was the art directionist uh goodness gracious it's all what her. an artist i know all of that even though it's a weird thing i want to discuss in the movie a little bit which is the idea that the movie's looking a lot like the 60s but it's still showing off as present day i i i noticed that um especially in the outdoor scenes when they're like outside in arcata Mm. Um, and in the background, you can kind of see like, oh, that car was definitely post 2000. <laughs> but, yeah. And and I think this movie does this a lot, actually, is it it has these features that are either in the background that remind you that like, no, this is a movie that was just made. Um, yeah. Or I feel like they break into mm. these moments where. Mm you are kind of taken out of the genre for like a second. It yeah. doesn't, it no longer sounds like that and looks maybe like that picture perfect. Mm. You couldn't believe it's the sixties. Like, I feel like, um, I feel like they do this on purpose almost to kind of mm. prod, prod the audience to remind you like, Hey, we're making commentary here. We're, I know it looks good, mm. but it is not, it is not the thing itself. It is a reply to in response. Yeah, it's, by saying it technically in the present day, but having the look of an older movie, it's meaning that it can feel like it could partly make get away get away per se of using some of the stereotypical tropes that might be in those sixties movies, but put them in a modern aesthetic and analyze them that way. There was one bit that did make me giggle because I didn't notice this properly. Everything I know is oh the cars are a bit off. Oh some of the extras have different costumes. There's one scene where one of the when one of the characters Trish just takes out a mobile phone. And she takes it out. It's a bit bricky, but you sit there going. Like, wait a minute <laughs> yeah it, it's a, it's one of those moments and i i i found myself going oh okay i was enjoying this movie a lot and i was so lost in genre and so mm. lost in like this is the the verisimilitude of the uh the movie got me and i, I yeah. appreciated these moments that took took me back out and went like we're commenting on this mm. um and that that then those moments for me really made um, all the other scenes where perhaps, especially when the writing mm. and then the characters were uh, extremely like cookie cutter 
from yeah. the these sixties films that it's emulating. Mm. Um, I feel like it's uh, for example a scene that is making me think this. Um, uh, recall it, this was later in the film, the second half of the film, when those mm. twins were on stage. <laughs> yes, and those bartenders who were this breath of fresh air throughout this entire movie. Yeah. These bartenders were like, they can't even dance. And they're very modern, like, yeah. talking crap about some girls on stage that can't dance. Who are those new girls? They can't dance at all. And they're weird. I don't know, but the customers really like them. They're friends of the witches. I've seen them coming together before. Yeah. The witches. They're everywhere. One gin and tonic, Sam. Gin and tonic, coming up. Did you read about the teacher buried in the backyard of his cabin? They said it was done by the witches. Oh, yeah, I read about that. They found all sorts of witchcraft things on the grave. Yeah, I heard about that, too. Creepy. Yeah. And then immediately following that, like mm. the very next conversation was this, um, was uh, Elaine and Grip having yeah. that back and forth at the bar, mm. you know, right before he goes and gets killed. Um, mm. And there, it, it, that conversation between them was this like peak confrontation between stereotypical, like the feminine idea they were putting in this film and dis dissecting, and then this masculine ideal they were dissecting. Yeah, And because they just had that very real conversation at mm. the bar, and then it went right next to them, it made it seem all the more absurd. Is that conversation feels like a very stereotypical, almost film noir kind of conversation, where she's a femme fatale character and Griff is the hard-boiled, hard-boiled detective character, and they're both just clashing at each other. Elaine, the DNA came back from the lab. Connects you with Wayne Peters. And Patricia Manning, came by the station, some things of yours, including this. She said you drove her husband to suicide. So I was a bad girl. Are you going to punish me? What sort of person are you, Elaine? What sort of sick mind would do such things? Why are you so negative? I didn't kill anyone. Wayne died of heart failure after a beautiful night of lovemaking. And Richard died because he loved me too much. These men weren't used to the deep feelings of love that they were experiencing with me. Are you saying these men died of love? That's insane. What about the spells and the drugs? Are you saying witchcraft had nothing to do with it? Witchcraft is just a way of concentrating energy. It can only work with what's already there. I just used sex magic to create love magic. I didn't know how strong the spells would be. Sometimes it's almost scary how strong the love gets. Love. What do you know about love? What you call love is a borderline personality disorder. Or worse. Don't diagnose me. Maybe you're a narcissist who can't love. You think that I'm sick because you've never loved like I have. I would do anything for love. Talk about, I mean, we talked about how beautiful it is, but like, can we talk about how beautiful it is? Like, Yes, please. Um, let, let's let talk about how, one of one, one things, how beautifully colorful it is and the perfect choices on all the color aesthetic, like the reds really pop, the blacks really pop, yes. the pinks, so much pink. Um, yeah. that, and then like that house on like, the, the Victoriana is mm. so like, it, it's very, it's a little, it's very satanic panic. It like yes. especially because like that that Victorian house that she's staying in, mm. it's in it's in Arcata, which is uh, probably about four or five, maybe six. No, sure. probably not that long. Four hours from here. I'm okay. in San Francisco. Um, but it's it's up in uh, Humboldt County, and sure. so there's that that connection of like, well, we're in San Francisco, but that's where we grow our weed and always has. Mm. Um, and so there's that like, OK, so and she talks about, you know, getting away from the barrier and going up to the woods. And it really is that like 
that pipeline of, of connection there. So that Victoriana house is so very echoing San Francisco for me, which we all ha- we have those huge Victorians here that we're known for, those mm. colorful ones. Um, and it, it, I really just loved the immersion in the um, that level of reference to yeah. n- numerous places and times. Mm. Yeah, because it, yeah, it's, it's a lot of things in this movie where obviously it's set in the present day, but it looks like a 60s movie. There's also references to things older and later, and it becomes almost like a weird timeless bubble where you can yeah where you can't really define where everything is from, but you can, it allows yourself to be everywhere. Yeah. And, and in, in that way, it also kind of goes, well, those patriarchy issues we've had since like, this is a Victorian problem. <laughs> this has so, not changed all no. this time. <laughs> and and you know, that, that Victorian problem. Yeah. That, that problem looked like this in the sixties and it looks mm. like this now. But I think this is a thing I want to I want to throw this at you, because one of the things I notice a lot about this is there's a lot of bizarre sort of all the reviews for this movie. What the movie's been compared to a little bit feels a little bit out of whack. Um, I'm not sure if you heard about what the reviews were saying, but a lot of the people who review the movie, even positively, um, have said that the thing that, that comes to their mind was mostly sexploitation movies and even the works of Russ Meyer, which, if you know, is things like um, Pussycat Kill Kill and Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Um, but the way you were describing it actually allows even more to say, because because uh, Anna Miller actually then said this, and I, I can quote it, that she actually was generally offended by having her work compared to Russ Meyer because Russ Meyer is... Well, Russ Meyer is Russ Meyer, where basically all the women are just boobs. And in this case, none of her movies, none, none of the women in this movie are just boobs. Even the ones who are trying to be are poked fun of for being boobs. Like the two girls that just can't dance to save their lives. When I was watching this film, I really felt, um, I felt that it, the, the point could very easily be missed. Yes. Comparing... This to Russ Meyer film absolutely aesthetically makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. But what I really see her doing is um, taking all of the aesthetic of this film and going to this logical conclusion Mm. of, okay, if this is the kind of woman that you are portraying as a a real person, Mm. this is what that looks like. Uh, so like Elaine's transatlantic accent, like okay. they don't do that accent was never re, like it's not a real accent, and it was put on in films to be transatlantic, and she's the only person who talks like this. Okay, interesting because I have noticed like, I, I I couldn't tell where because everyone else has an accent to some degree, and she I don't know where she was trying to portray. She was like yeah the transatlantic thing, which is just is it just universal American-ish English, basically? No, it's it's a film accent. So, like, think Cary Grant, right? Sure. Like, you know, it, it's that, it, um, and I know that in early film, they uh, a lot of people affected a transatlantic accent specifically, you know, so that the films could be transatlantic. Mm. And there was this, like, cultural, like, sort of exchange during, like, this was, like, post-war. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so you, and it reminded me a lot of like, think about the way like Fred Astaire speaks in his films and things like that. Okay. Um, And so it really harkened back to that, but it also harkens back, that kind of accent harkens back to the flat line delivery that you see a lot. And it Mm. feels like a middle school play sometimes, which I see. And I laughed at these moments of like the bad acting that was done on purpose, like scare quote, bad acting, scare quote, Mm. bad writing. And those were a fun juxtaposition with uh, the, you know, quote, better written scenes, because Mm. it made me think like, well, what is actually going on here in this moment that I'm meant to be paying attention to? It does draw your attention. Mm. And I think when people, when, when characters speak in this like flat fashion, what you're kind of, you're kind of meant to be like, well, why is this flat? And I, I was thinking about like, um, the conversations between Elaine and Trish, um, yes. so flat, so just like wait, like waiting for the next person to say the line, then you give your line. And I, I was, I was thinking, okay, this is presented as like just girly things. Mm. Like this is the kind of conversation, well, just girly things. They don't matter. It doesn't matter how it's 
presented or delivered. But it's what's what's even funnier when you say how it's presented or delivered is that all these scenes are presented in like a, in a set that looks like cake. Like my favorite scenes, my all my favorite scenes, because I'm just thinking, where the hell is this tea room? Because this Victorian tea room where everything is pink. Only women are allowed to go in there. And there's a flipping harp player. I'm going, where do you find a place like this? And do you need to, what, is there a club membership? But I mean, I go every Thursday and just men are invited. <laughs> you just go in and just go, hey, uh, wearing the big hats and everything. Where were we? <laughs> oh, uh, men, you said we need to give them what they want. Well, what do men want? Just a pretty woman to love and to take care of them and to make them feel like a man and to give them total freedom in whatever they want to do or be. <laughs> but what about what we want? How are we going to be equals with men if we keep catering to all of their needs? I think that if you want love, you have to give love. Giving men sex is a way of unlocking their love potential. You sound as if you've been brainwashed by the patriarchy. Your whole self-worth is wrapped up in pleasing a man. I'll admit I used sex to get this, but I'm not proud of it. The whole world doesn't revolve around a man's needs. If I gave Richard sex every time he wanted it, I'd be a wreck. Poor Richard. He loves you, and he wants you, and you torture him. You have to give a man his fantasy. <laughs> his fantasy? Yes, his fantasy. I have a theory. I'm going to throw this at you like a whoosh. I have a theory here. Um, and I mean... I mean, Annabella actually said a lot that the whole point of uh, having... Okay, the idea of how Elaine as a character got made, as in the witch here, she actually said that when she was coming up with the idea for the script, she was actually looking at relationship self-help books and noticing a particular piece of advice where if, if a woman wants to get a man, for example, that she needs to love him less in order to not feel like he's being suffocated. Because she realizes a weird parallel with this, where the idea of, and there's female characters in classic cinema where basically she, that the woman can literally love someone to death, right? And so I feel like having, so, so, so having sort of Elaine and, um, and Trish, they are the two polar opposites of this effect. And they're performing this way, where basically Elaine, being the love witch, she's very overly suffocating with or with with all the men that she comes with. Like saying, instantly, like literally on the first date, goes and says, "I love you. I'm gonna be with you for the rest of your life." Which anyone on the first date, that's a that's a problem a bit much. Mm -hmm. While Trish is the opposite. While Trish basically is more about, well, what about me? I'm I, I want to I, I want to I, I, I don't want to be this clingy. Thing he, he, to, to the point that basically it does cause a bit of a rough marriage. Um, but point being is again, there's two polar opposites. So when they're performing each other, it's like having two two magnets kind of bouncing off each other, and they just and none of it's clicking. So the conversation between the two is supposed to feel off, especially when it happens later on when the roles are almost reversed. Absolutely, I would agree with that, and I love that scene where Trish later is putting on the makeup and the lingerie. Mm. And I love I'm, that scene. It's, it's good. And you can just, you see, it's like the only scene in the movie where things don't like look right. Yes. Like you can see it doesn't fit. You can mm. see this, that's not your color girl. Like, don't, don't do that. You're doing <laughs> like, um, It's like, you're like, don't try this. It's getting weird. As a weird. fellow redhead. Yeah. As don't fellow... wear the pink. Don't wear the pink. Um, <sighs> yeah, it's a but, lot of pink. Oh, yes, so much paint. But and and you just see the way it doesn't fit. And mm. um, and and, uh, and it kind of the presentation of women in general in this film is mm. it really that opens it up to this. Like, as Trish was putting on the makeup, I was thinking to myself, OK, how interchangeable do mm. women look? How interchangeable are women? And okay. almost at a, yeah, and it's almost at a point when when she's fully dressed up in the gear with the black wig and everything, other than just a few things, she looks exactly yeah. like 
Elaine, like down to the T almost. Yeah. I, I love that because that, this is what I call the, the performative feminine. Mm. Like, and because of the, the level of makeup and hair and clothing mm. and like the, the perf- all the performance that goes into being this gender, um, it, it kind of demonstrates, especially as she's putting these things on, it mm. really goes to show that that itself is almost like a form of witchcraft. Yeah. And, um, you know, as she's performing it, it's not really, it doesn't really suit her. It doesn't fit her because that's not quite like who she is. Mm. And it kind of makes you, it, it goes into questions about, okay, well, what is feminine power? If like, cause that ain't it. Mm. Then what is feminine power? And because Trish has none, Elaine has none. <laughs> like she's a murderer, but is she powerful? No, because the second Trish was like, you're the bitch who killed my husband, like gonna go kill her. Mm. Like he's like on the bed, like, uh-huh, uh-huh, like really tiny and small. Yeah. This is a bit where I might come in with a bit of a, a knowledge drop for you, my friend. Sure. <laughs> the more the better. Um, I found this to be a really, I don't want to say like obvious. It was obvious to me because I've been there and I feel like this must have hit home for many, many people in the audience. Um, it's it's this comment on, I think, uh, spaces that are pseudo progressive and pseudo feminist. Mm. that are full of like male gaze and male control and Mm. then men defining women for them with the added danger that this is like there are women complicit in this abuse Mm. and they and it makes it seem all the more not what it is like that Gahan character the guy the The high priest yeah, your high priest witch. Mm. You know, like he just had sex with everyone because that was like his right, apparently. And I cannot I Johan, I've met I've met dozens of these men. Yeah. That's All a bit. Of, I, I've lived globally. They're not just here in San Francisco. I, I specifically see the Bay Area culture called out because boy, do I know a lot of those guys here. Um <laughs> But, you know, the guy's like, oh, I showed up to this party in the community. Hey, I just met you. Why are you acting like I'm your girl? Yeah. Excuse me. me. It happened here. Happens here all the time still. Mm -hmm. Um, Back when parties were a thing. Um, But then, you know, same thing happened when I lived in London and I was in the goth scene there. Just like, why is everybody acting like I'm their girl? Because I'm here. Mm. And you're in black. Um, So it's the, I, I see a lot of that in the film being communicated this Mm. like, Hey, these guys do these things and it's women. It's partially women's fault who just kind of go like, cause you see very often, I noticed a lot the camera cut. Yes. When Gahan was being himself, uh, being toxic and manipulative. Mm -hmm. And then it would cut to women's faces like extras or Mm -hmm. minor characters, their faces, and then kind of just looking on. Mm. And that those moments were kind of the most horrific for me. Like it was actually, it was like true horror for me a little bit because there's that, it's that question of like harassment is going on. Mm. Do they not see it? Am I the only, am I crazy? So it's that gaslighting community effect. Mm. And that's where like the horror of this movie lies for, for me. 
Hello, and welcome to the Enigmatic Insert, where I take you aside and help analyze any key terms or theories that we may stumble upon in our review. So from this point onwards, Eliza and I start to look closely at feminist gender theory, but we reference a lot the term the male gaze. Now you may be wondering exactly what this term means, and it has a lot of history behind it. You may have heard the term, but let's look into what it actually is defined by. The male gaze was first coined by British filmmaker and feminist film theorist Laura Mulvey in her essay Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. Here, she explored how the film industry was structured around a mostly male hierarchy, and so films mostly benefit the likes of cisgendered heterosexual men. The camera, and so the forceful gaze of the audience, would represent the wants, desires, and needs of the now considered male demographic, and not the voices of the other, like women or people of color. The camera would move and focus and act in a fashion that would fetishize women, idolize masculine projection, and glorify violence. Laura Mulvey herself started to feel as though she was not being seen by the film she loved, and so wanted to explore an alternative. My shift in spectatorship came very suddenly and specifically out of the influence of the women's movement. So that films that I'd loved, films that had moved me, I was suddenly watching with different eyes. Instead of being absorbed into the screen, into the story, into the mise-en-scene and the beauty of the cinema, I was irritated. And instead of being an absorbed spectator, a voyeuristic spectator, a male spectator, as it were, I suddenly found I'd become a woman spectator who watched the film f from a distance and critically rather than with those um, absorbed eyes. And that would eventually become what would be known as the feminine gaze. Laura Mulvey made quite a few theory films, as she would call them, which allowed to explore the use of the camera to become a definitive voice. If you attach this as well as the writers of Griselda Pollock and Marianne Doan, they would explore the notion that stating that because there's now becoming a rise of female representation in the film and media industry, especially in roles of power, such as directors, producers, cinematographers, it's allowing for a new perspective or a voice to be heard, or in this case, to be the female spectator. Now, it is not a flip version of the male gaze, where now men are now being objectified, but it's where the camera and the characters on the screen are being shown with sensitivity, diversity, and equality. Having the scenes focus more on the emotional impact it is having to others, rather than the shock value or for titillation. Annabella's Love Witch very much falls into the latter, where every scene is shot beautifully and tastefully, but also allowing the audience to not focus solely on the sex and violence in this movie, which there is a lot of, but on the meaning and the consequences behind those actions, especially when examining the psyche of our titular Love Witch, Elaine. Eliza also suggested that this could be more than just that, but also a full deconstruction of this theory. I'll let her explain. It explores, it, it, what it really, it explores the unhealthy dynamic that I think the, the history of the male gaze kind of sets up for itself. Yeah. Um, like, you know, think about like the body couch in this movie. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of like, I feel like there's, there's kind of a moral of the story mm. uh, of like, and this is like the fairy tale aspect of it, not necessarily the thesis of the film, but yeah. one, like the, the moral of the fairy tale is like, well, men, watch out, because if, if, if you're going to buy into this whole patriarchal feminine ideal, she needs to be this, she needs to be that and the other thing and do all of this. Mm. Well, this is what you're going to get. If you, want to, if you want to talk about a scene, to me, that's the full thesis of the movie, but it's also the bit where, while I'm, because while, while watching this movie again, I was almost like in a, an a, like analytical phase. I'm going, I'm going to analyze the shit out of this. But then, <laughs> then it's the Renaissance scene, which 
I'm it's one it's the move it's the most it's the corniest scene in the whole movie it's a proper fairy tale it comes a little bit out of left field and the song is absolutely hilarious because you're sitting there going these are terrible lyrics <laughs> so bad <laughs> They are charming, are they not? Yes, quite charming. I see two people in love. This calls for a wedding. A wedding? Yes, a mock wedding, if you will. To honor the gods of love. Love is a magical thing. Love will make you feel like a queen or a king. Unicorns, rainbows, lucky charms await you in your true love's arms. I recall when I when I lived in England, I'd really I, I enjoy Renaissance fairs, and I yeah. had a really hard time finding one to attend when I yeah. lived in it. Um, I don't think that they're really a thing there. It, yeah, I don't think there is. I think it's because I think it's just for for, for the UK. It's just history. So it's like yeah. there you yeah. go. Well, 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 something like America. It's almost because it's it's like a history, but it's like hey, we could uh, we could have a bit of fun with this because it's not technically in a weird way. It's like it's not technically your history in a weird way. So you can go like you can go a bit more silly with it. Let's go beyond this, as it were. Let's go more f- fantasy, medieval nonsense. You're right. We are a lot more fun over here. Yeah, I know. You're right. <laughs> we, God, God damn it. <laughs> I, I, want, I want to go to a Renaissance fair. It sounds like fun. Okay, uh, so now I have a whole trip itinerary for you to come by. Um, yes, I need that. Um, <laughs> but I think that's the scene for me where the thesis of the movie properly kicks in. Because, so we, this is the point where um, Elaine's actually met up with Griff, who is the most who basically, Griff is the most manly man-man in the history of men. In in terms of having no emotion, being just a... And even and even they, they hired a perfect actor for this because even the actor who has, like, the perfect, like, Holly, old Hollywood-style chin and everything, he has the aesthetic. Yeah. Like, Well, I mean, okay, so not no emotion. He got... A- he had angry. He got angry. Yeah, and he, got, he got punched, very angry. punched his partner in the face. That I, was that was the most hilarious moment in the movie. Just, you're way out of line. Just this. <laughs> to be honest, it didn't look like much of a punch. It looked no, like a, uh, it was so hilariously fake, and just this moment of like, yeah, man, stuff. I see this woman is a dangerous character, and you better watch her. You mean because she's a witch? That doesn't mean anything. No, her husband died of a drug he'd never taken before. And did you ever find where Wayne Peters got the devil's weed? I questioned Miss Curtis about that. There was devil's weed growing near his cabin. Apparently, he experimented often with drugs. Come on, Griff, can't you connect the dots? We have a possible murder here, and Elaine is our only suspect. I told you, we're laying off her. Because of orders or because you're in love with her? Who says I'm in love with her? Get the hell off my back! You're out of line, Griff. Way out of line. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. This man stuff is being shown again. It's like just like the presentation of the women being a little bit faked and like a little bit off. That this this pure scene of masculine macho machismo is done comically. Um, so basically, everyone gets a everyone gets a bit of a nudge here. Basically, everyone gets a poke in in that. Absolutely, so that Renaissance Fair scene where yeah. and like I I found it. And definitely the thesis. Like there's mm. there's so much to unpack there. Mm. Because they get they get hand fasted, they get married, and then mm. they um they're sitting down and like she's cooing over him, and then you get for the first time somebody else's voiceover. Yes. And it's his. And you get this whole TED talk about um, I should say soliloquy, but mm. you get this entire soliloquy about him just about this dynamic. Mm. this opposite dynamic from her. And I found that really fascinating because her, every, all of her, uh, her voiceovers in the film up to that point have been about, you know, needing a man to be this and that and strong and emo- just like what Griff is. Yeah. And what he's saying is, but then at the same time, he's going like, he's the polar opposite of like, I can't love her. You, you love him less. They're going to suffocate you. And 
it sh- it really just shows that paradox of mm. where these two things meet. Like you, this masculine a quote ideal and the feminine ideal meeting exist in conflict, mm. which is hinted at by like Elaine's uh, when she was talking to her witch friend yeah. earlier, and she's like, "There's no polarity." Mm. So she she wants that polarity, and it's both characters express what they want, mm. and it appears to be the opposite the, the other character so like what what they each say say that they want seems like it's the other one mm. but it is in fact the opposite yeah so it's I, like it's saying when you this is completely paradoxical because you can't say that these opposite things come together and something works that's not <laughs> relationships yeah it's it doesn't work because basically they, these are the two extremes and you have the two extremes they bash you to each other of course they're not going to work so realistically you need to have a happy medium but then the movie's trying to say what is a happy medium here because it's very difficult because movie particularly if you look at cinema and movies they rarely do have something when someone as a character or as a lead going this is a happy medium how does that work Something I found and noticed is when Griff and Elaine meet for the first time, I mean, Elaine is automatically trying to do her, all her magical love gaze thing and like, like she's done with the other two men, but it doesn't seem to work entirely on him. Like it, and the thing is, is that it's work. what it is, like she, he's starting to feel like attraction to her naturally, like she's liking her, not the love version that she's presenting because you can tell that because when 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 they first meet she's he, she, he's interrogating her basically and she does have a very fragile moment where it's saying like witchcraft is my religion this is the reason how i got properly for the first time i think for ever in the movie she feels genuinely fragile and is like wait a minute this is this is the you this doesn't sound it, it, doesn't, it doesn't even entirely even sound like the cadence that she's saying she's speaking like a person and so it's like okay so this is the real you here this is how you genuinely feel about stuff and she and, and he's and he's into that and so it's like well you know what let's go horse riding let me take you on horses and then and then so there's already a natural attraction which she's very confused by because like you like me for me i'm not used any of my love magic like i i thought the only way i can attract a man's through love magic miss parks are you a witch yes i am is there a law against that i guess not not unless you do something wrong do you think that being a witch makes me evil capable of murder even no i i wasn't trying to imply sergeant meadows do you know what it's like to really suffer? You have to fight and fight until you're too exhausted to go on. Witchcraft is my religion, Sergeant. And this religion, which is older than your Christianity, saved my life. Miss Parks, I'm sorry if I've offended you. I didn't realize. That's all right, Sergeant. Meadow. I have an alternate perspective sure. on that witchcraft stance. Because for me, that red is that I didn't see this like this moment of fragility. I, I'm watching it like, girl, you so full of it. Oh. Like, Okay, this is interesting. Tell me why. I feel like almost like because she she commits murder in this movie. Twice. And yeah, a number of times. Mm-hmm. Um, well, like three times, right? Um, no, twice. The other one's a suicide. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, and I feel like this. So her, her identity is as a witch. Mm. Um, th- this is definitely one of those like san francisco moments too so the church of satan originated in san francisco as you probably know mm. um and i i really felt that 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 was some that was a tie here and i feel like there's a lot of ties between you know like priests and like the church of satan and then gahan this gahan character she was a victim mm. right as, as a young woman her she they alluded to uh a bad relationship with her father yes being thrown away and then mm. who she picked up by by another guy 
yeah. discovered that Gahan and who told her she didn't define which herself as a witch. He was like, you're a witch and I'm going to fuck you and you're going to be a witch. And that's yeah. how that's going to work. And yeah. then he goes, no, you're powerful because men want you. You are powerful because you're a sex object. And I'm going to tell you that you're powerful and you're just going to believe me. Mm. So he's like, so he, there's this whole background of like, he had mansplained her entire identity to her at some point. Mm. And she's internalized this. And this is like why, why I find her interesting is like a character, this like cardboard cutout character, because she's yeah. internalized. You have here this, this person, this, this non-person yeah. who has so completely drank the patriarchal Kool-Aid that she is certain that she is empowered when all she's doing this entire movie is thirsting for a guy and looking for a man to validate her entire existence. The Coven's thesis, the Coven's like sort of main point is the idea of like, look, women have a, w women have a very unique power and it's the idea of sexuality and how you can use that to get what you want. It's, but it's the way it's presented always felt icky in the movie. It never felt like this is genuine female empowerment through sexuality. It doesn't feel like that. It feels like this is a man's idea of a woman's sexuality being their power and you're right there it feels genuinely yeah looking back at it now because i didn't realize that's a little bit too late i'm thinking like ew that's a bit ew i was just pointing out that dancing is a powerful thing for women and girls we asked you to meet us here tonight so you could learn about that do you see how powerful that girl is these men would do anything for her wouldn't you like to have that power yourselves then let us begin. All witches need to figure out where their power lies. And we feel that a woman's greatest power lies in her sexuality. We don't view this power as satanic or anti-feminist, but as a celebration of woman as a natural creature, an earthly body, a spiritual essence, and a womb. The whole history of witchcraft is interwoven with the fear of female sexuality. They burned us at the stake because they feared the erotic feelings we elicited in them. Later, they used marriage to hold us in bondage and made us into servants, whores, and fantasy dolls, never asking us what we wanted. They teach us that a normative human being is a hyper-rationalist, stoic male and that women's emotions and intuitions are illnesses that need to be cured. We believe that men and women are different and that true equality lies in that difference. We strive for male-female polarity and to regain our primal power as goddesses. We need to teach men how to love us using ways they can understand. So goddesses, use perfume, wear high heels and makeup, Learn to dress your hair in attractive ways. Display flesh artfully and know what to conceal. Be a mother and a lover. Stand your ground, but always let the man feel like a man. Use sex magic to destroy his fear of you and to open his heart to the floodgates of love. Only then will he begin to see you as a human being with all of your inner beauty. Then, when his heart is open to love, you may do with him what you will. I think Elaine as a character is a full-blown goddamn character study. Uh, because she is, you, you, I like the fact you mentioned she is, she is pretty much a cookie cutter thing. But then I'm sitting there thinking half the time is like, she is, const everything she does and says almost contradicts itself all the time. Where I'm sitting there very confused because I'm sitting there half the time. Are you purposely doing this? Like you're purposely almost killing off your men or is it actually done by accident? Because she does mention at some point saying, I'm just trying to have a mental health. I didn't know these love, these love potions and love spells would be so powerful, you know, as if, but then it's like, it's like, I'm saying, woman, you're making them yourself. You clearly know this somehow you know it's going to have repercussions because you killed your ex-husband in a similar manner so it's almost like is she destined to just repeat the same cycle over and over again where she can she she cannot be loved because of how she is just 
being like some kind of or is she act like is it like maliciously on purpose or is she actually sitting there going or she actually is this naive that she actually generally thinks that this is all done by accident it's so it's very conflicting there i'm not sure if she's a full-blown like almost machiavellian kind of sociopath or just really naive of her own ability or is she like a a device Mm. that you know, so it's like, okay, all the, all the, her, her body count, yeah. all the men who buy into this on some level who are mm-hmm. like, love, which, and, you know, they think that's what they want because that's mm. what they've been told they want, you yeah. know, because they live in the patriarchy too. That's what they've been told they want and need, but it's poison. It kills them. Like they take it, they, all of them put themselves 100% in a position to be murdered. Like, yeah, take this drug. Yeah, I'm going to drive you crazy till you kill yourself. Lay down in my bed and you know I'm a murderer. Shut your eyes. I'm going to yeah. stab your heart out. Mm. Um, it, so, like, it, it's almost like all of these are a bit of suicide to some mm. extent. Because it's like, well, gentlemen, if you want to buy into this patriarchy and if this is the kind of lady you apparently want, this is mm. what happens. Um, but then kind of going back to what you said about, like, the love magic and, like, what is it like when they play, like, the you know the Ennio Morricone music with the eyes. I love that. <laughs> and so, but I I challenge you to name a second of the movie that confirms that there's anything supernatural happening. A second, mm. I th- it is it is my because like I I I've had men fall apart on me like that you know without <laughs> drugs and it's like we were cool a second ago and now you think that I'm all this and I'm gonna do this for you and what what and so i'm i'm like i know i didn't do magic in those moments so i'm just thinking like these are some weird weak sauce guys not like weak in the way that she's saying them but like it's emotionally neediness like you apparently don't have good relationships in your life so you have to open up to the first woman who says she loves you even if it's just been two hours that is quite Um, literally the professor character isn't it like that's the that's the that's the university teacher who has has a sip of this drug who's basically well this drink that's basically vodka organic berries and hallucinogenic herbs which i love how she describes it casually like you don't just give that to someone on the first date no hmm I feel strange. Dizzy. What was in that drink you gave me? Organic berries, vodka, hallucinogenic herbs. Hallucinogenic herbs? (laughs) Oh, baby! You are really wild! The drug is so powerful for them that she that suddenly they have emotions and it's and is overwhelming them because yeah. uh, it's like to the point where the first he bursts into tears because he's like I don't know what's happening to me I'm feeling overwhelmed here yeah and he's like I've never had a woman give herself like this to me and so he's just like the overwhelmed by the the appearing genuineness of it I can't take it I can't take it oh more. Oh. Elaine, I'm sick. I'm sick. Hey, it's all right. I've got you. I love you. Mm. And I'll always be here for you. Try to get some sleep. What a pussy. What a baby. I thought I'd found a real man, but he's just like a little girl. No one was ever there for me when I was crying my heart out. No one ever comforted me. No one. Like, I, I love that there's no actual actual magic going on because, yeah. like, no, she doesn't, she doesn't have powers. She was told she has powers by some creep. Yeah. The one time where 
it's like, is there magic going on mm. when after Trish leaves and she's like, you'll burn for this and leaves. And um, Elaine is there and she grabs like that amulet and she goes, crash, die. Yes. Cra- she, we, we don't know that. I don't think that happened. I don't think that happened. No, not at all. I, I would love it. If, it would be weird to suddenly say, oh, it did work. That means it, it kind of emphasizes the fact that, oh, these potions are actually magic. This is actually doing something and not just people who are just in a, uh, being almost manipulated by this woman. Like, for example, Richard, who is the husband character, who literally, he, she is 100% playing on his own insecurities on this. Like a thousand percent. Like the idea is saying, look, um, I got my I got my wife Trish, who basically she's a lovely woman, but she is she's all just th- there's no excitement or anything there. She he wants to literally quote, I say, do a bit of mischief. I, it's like I've you know I've, we've been married for ten years and we haven't done anything like, and I, I've never had the chance to be my like my my mischievous self, right? And so she yeah. leans into it and quite literally just says, "Well, let me be mischievous." Strips dances in front of him. So by that point, especially after you've had a couple of drinks and a, what seemed to be a very good cake, um, you're gonna fall for it and. You're basically playing on a man's insecurities here. This is not my magical dancing. It's just a very fragile man being used at the time, basically. And yeah, and but then that also goes to well, well, sir, who's responsible for your marriage and being happy in it? But you, yeah, because he's going, oh, Lane, I can tell you all this because you're this type of woman, like. Dude, your your wife has been your wife for ages. She she has done nothing through this whole film but talk about loving you. So talk to her. Talk maybe. to your wife like- and say, hey, it's been 10 years and I'm realizing the spice isn't there. Can we talk about a bit of spice? And maybe she would have had a bit more spice. Or yeah, or just like I've been having this fantasy. Can you but he doesn't view his wife as a nuanced human being. He mm. Or perhaps he married somebody that he felt he was supposed to be marrying because she looks like a perfect wife. Like that that haircut, man. <laughs> that, <laughs> that weird sort of poofy little thing there, yeah. <laughs> it's so like, wow, you are like, it's like a, they say, they do invoke Stepford Wives later with, yeah, with Elaine. Mention it. I found it was interesting because I'm like, but she's like the slutty Stepford wife. Like Trish is the Stepford wife. Yeah, she's, she's very much like, this is what, a wife is but obviously elaine is this is this is literally said i am your sorted love affair i'm the fantasy girl but obviously there's a thing like there are some pe- people out there who go out and say you know what let's have a lustful night of fun and that's the thing is by having just a lustful night of fun and saying this is my sexy fantasy it's never going to go to anything more while elaine's saying like well because i'm your sexy fantasy we should i am your perfect woman we should be married instantly because i am everything you ask for when you should, when it isn't, it drives a man. It drives Richard completely insane to the point that she, she, he can never really have her properly, and so kills himself. And then obviously the professor just literally what seems to be crying, cry, literally cries to death from from over emotion. Yeah, I, I, I would assume he just died of the, you know, the drugs that she gave. <laughs> but- True, but the idea also, if you want to be romantic about, it, is the idea because Elaine on purpose almost puts him on a test and says like i'm going to say don't leave me like he becomes like don't leave me it's like don't worry i'll be right here doesn't leave never spends any time with the room after he has a breakdown and and that to the point that maybe and this is the romantic way of looking at it he died from a broken heart (laughs) how sad yeah but thinking about that and thinking about what you said about richard you know was crazy because he could never really have her well she never went to any of these people like she was not emotionally available at all Like who she was claiming to be does not yeah. exist. Mm. Yeah, yeah, because it, it, it's it's all it's all an act. Like every time I'm saying, it, she says the exact same things as well. Poor, poor baby, I'm always here for you. It's an act. It's a full blown act, which makes her even more of a sociopath. Yeah, and if I can invoke another film that I feel like that in particular really echoed for me, Heather's. Mm. Yes, a thousand percent. Just like this, like cookie cutter women surrealist like environment and then just the level of sociopathy (laughs) i i also want to point out one more thing that hasn't been brought up that i feel is important um i think that annabella points out 
also that this whole like that all these problems this of the the people that Elaine is running with who Elaine yeah. is and the the spaces in the communities that are mm. these toxic places yeah um every every single person it, it, that is that is in these toxic places for her or it has been toxic to her is white i feel that there's this comment of like you know this is this is a white issue mm. or rather like staying in a lane not Elaine, but like staying in one's lane of like, and it, you, and I have to say, like with the commentary that's being done about you know the patriarchy and male mm. gaze, adding that racial layer of like, well, white men exist at the top, yeah, and you know when they're in control of these spaces and in control of women, that's that's that extra dynamic of power mm. that's being discussed and that problem of white cis het run spaces mm. this will all this will be that problem that yeah. problem will continue not with every single you know cis white het guy individually but it will always be suspect reasonably so when they're in charge of spaces we must be suspect and this is something just to throw out quickly then while we mention that is there's only two black characters mentioned and seen in the entire movie one which is this black female cop who, both cops. they're both cops actually you've got the black female cop who's sort of just there clearly flirting a little bit with griff but doing she's the one approaching him right and doing that kind of thing and doing whatever and doing like hey you know we're gonna are you up for dinner tonight i always make a great coffee put me to the test blah 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 and she's and she's more independent that way but then we've got the partner now the partner was interesting is the partner doesn't the partner instantly already knows that elaine did the murder like instantly, like says like she did it. It's very obvious. And Griff, because she, because he's now having this sort of weird moment where it's all like, I like her. I don't really want to do this. Let's just cut the case or whatever. It's a heart attack, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, no, no, I'm not falling for it. Because the idea is almost like Griff is encouraging this in this point. Mm -hmm. Griff is encouraging the, it's like, like the witch has been here for a long time. We shouldn't be messing with them. But it's like saying, well, that means you're now encouraging this behavior. You're allowing yeah, this behavior and to happen. And you, you kind of witness that behind the scenes of like how that level of privilege works, mm. that she's just allowed to continue doing this. Yeah. And, and, and without, and that's the thing is once, the, once, once, a, once a partner gets punched in the face, we don't see him again. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, that's it. You go way out of line. End. And it just kind of shows that this, yeah, if you want to mention it and approach it that way, it's showing like the sort of, yeah, the white privilege situation and, and that little sits there and also the idea of saying like, hey, look, if something bad is happening, you should just actually say it and stop encouraging this kind of behavior. Yeah. And then thinking about the the female cop, yeah. um, I found her because I, I, I paid very close attention to the scenes that she was in because she had so little screen time, mm. but she had lines. I found her to be a really fascinating foil mm. to every other woman in the movie because and, and they made a point she was beautiful like she was made up her yeah, hair she's was gorgeous pretty, like her, she had this long hair that was down which is you know not how cops are allowed to wear their hair yeah. but she's she's made up and she is uh sexual and forward and confident mm. but mm. Casual, but but casual about it not there's no desperation there's no neediness there's no like deeper meaning behind it even it's just like you want coffee and you know coffee i don't know it's slaying especially in like the 60s but um mm. and 70s uh cop getting a cup of coffee is having sex mm. um Didn't know that so, and, yeah especially so especially casually um yeah like for example so like my uh, uh it one one story from my mother who was in san francisco in the 60s and 70s as yeah. a young sexy lady at the time mm -hmm. um got got asked on the street all the time hey you want to go for a cup of coffee uh, and like so that, that's what that is cough. It, it basically it's the it's it's that time's netflix and chill isn't it yeah yeah it's like yeah let's go get a cup of coffee i make good coffee like things like that mm -hmm. so she's she's this foil because she's she's made up she's beautiful she does you know she has that love magic she's she has the performative feminine going yeah but she's literally powerful she's got a gun yeah. um and you know, she's got a gun she's got a stick she got a badge and she's uh, she can just sleep with whoever she wants and it's not a big deal because she is actually more of an empowered woman because she's not 
desperate. She's, you know, she doesn't go kill Griff when he's like, not tonight. Yeah. She she looks at him like, all right, weirdo, I'm going to go find someone else. Yeah. It's basically, is this one tiny character the most real woman in the whole movie? I mean, I identify the most with her. That's that- for certain. <laughs> It's amazing how just breaking this down and realizing, hey, that side character is the most real woman in the whole movie and everyone else is a cartoon, an over-exaggeration or an exam or, or literally a thesis in its own right. Yeah. And it's and it's like we're over here zooming in on these like weird white people and their problems because yeah. like these, these problems of of uh, how much privilege do I have versus I mean, it's like, come on now, like these, these are very non <laughs> reality problems these are not Mm. problems of the working class right these are not problems of people like yeah first world problems first world problems (laughs) well first world problems (laughs) well first Let's do an elevator pitch of this movie if in other words if you have to sell this movie to someone who's never seen it before in a couple of sentences how would you do it so difficult Mm, because you have to figure I, out what angle would you have to go for with this? Do you want to watch a sexy murder romp? And, and, and you start off with that going, excuse me? Say, yes. And you can break it down to saying like, well, actually, what, now I've got you. Let's talk about how this is basically breaking down the feminine patriotic and then going down even further. Going, this is also a bit about this. This is also about that. It's also about gender and uh, gender norms and sexuality and everything else. But also it does have sexy witches in it. So there you go. <laughs> And I, w- I would conclude my elevator speech with go home, witches, go home. <laughs> go home, witches. <laughs> go home. I love that bit. <laughs> that so- guy, that guy was so, so perfect. He was like the cherry on top of this movie. You just needed somebody like that. I love the bit. The last time you see him, he literally just shouts, ah. <laughs> <laughs> He's just screaming at the sky. <laughs> And so that is the end of our review of Annabella's The Love Witch, a film that has so much to analyze that Eliza and I barely made a dent. It is entirely open to interpretation and examination, a real surprise considering how it was only considered to be nothing more than a quirky sex movie when it first launched. Using film studies and gender theory, here allowed to really explore everything and put our own spin on this subject. Eliza herself sums up quite nicely here why film is so much more fun to dissect. I teach film studies to my seventh graders a little bit, but my background is literature. So I'm I'm forever like, no, let's really, really talk. <laughs> and then looking at how forum imitates content, but like in films, it's great because in, in books, all you have is words in literature. So, but it's like in a film, you have so many layers of media happening at once that you can then like put together. And I was so delighted when I found it. Like anyone more like they, they took the music from like uh, the Diablo Mel Cervello movie that he did. I loved that so much because it it just it not only added that level of like um, realism for like the time and that echo, but just that they're echo they're echoing devil in the brain as they're doing this other scene, as they're saying this line, as this costume choice is going on. And it's just all of this together in one little package. It's like there's a, an immense amount you can dissect. I would like to thank my guest Eliza for her time and her and the wonderful insight into this not so trash film. I will eventually fly to the States and see you there. Thank you all for listening to this lovely episode. If you like what you hear and want more of this, or even have any suggestions for movies to review, please like, share, and leave a review on all podcast platforms. It will help with the algorithm to reach more cinephile ears and create more movie magic together. And with that, this essay is closed. And we'll return soon for another Not-So-Trash review. See you all next time, cinephiles.